11 Days in Malta Day 1, A Day in Valletta or Sliema How to Spend a Day in Valletta, Sliema and St. Julian's No alt text provided for this image. Most people would spend a minimum of one day in the city of Valletta. The city is beautiful and has so much to offer. Earlier, we already wrote an article with all the practical information and the sites Valletta has to offer. If you haven't that much time though, you can decide to visit the places Valletta, Sliema and St. Julian's in one day. In my opinion the cities are all easy to reach, because the cities run into each other. You can easily go from Sliema to St. Julian's by foot, so that's also the reason why these three places are pretty good to visit in one day. Although Valletta probably would be the most impressive city, your trip isn't complete without paying a visit to the tourist places St. Julian's. During my trip to Malta, I visited Valletta, Sliema and St. Julian's in one day and I've seen much during this day. In this article I would like to share with you how I spend one day in the three places. No alt text provided for this image. From Paola to Valletta by bus. Before we travel to Malta, we already heard from people it isn't easy to park your rental car in or around Valletta. Because of the fact we wanted to rent a car, this wasn't a place to book an accommodation. That's also the reason why we booked our accommodation in Powler, a town located just under Valletta. Powler is definitely the perfect starting point for visiting Valletta, but also Marzaskaler and Masaxlok. Close to our accommodation we found a bus stop. The bus is a very popular transportation on Malta and is used a lot by tourists as well as by locals. We decided to travel to Valletta by bus, due to the small amount of parking places in the city itself. With the bus we arrived close to the Valletta city gate, from where we walked through the main street towards the war museum, Fort St. Elmo, at the waterfront. No alt text provided for this image. War Museum for St. Elmo The war museum represents the important role Malta and its people played during World War II as well as Malta's important military role after 1800 under British rule. The museum also displays items from the First World War and from the two years of French occupation. I personally always find museums about World War II impressive, so if it's your interest as well, this museum definitely is worth a visit. The museum is opened all year round from Monday until Sunday from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. In summertime, from the 1st of April until the 30th of September, the museum is opened one hour longer, until 6 p.m. The entrance fee for adults is Euro 10, dash. For youths, 12 to 17 years, students and senior citizens, 60 plus, it costs Euro 7,50. Children, 6 to 11 years, pay Euro 5,50 and infants can enter the museum for free. War Siege Memorial and Monument to Sir Alexander Ball After our visit to the War Museum, we decided to walk further across the waterfront, where we ended up at the War Siege Memorial. This World War II memorial features simple, yet symbolic, design underlining a link between generations of Malta defenders. It's very impressive to walk around and to have a look at the War Siege Memorial, but also at the Siege Bell War Memorial, which is just in front of it. Close to the War Siege Memorial, you can find the monument to Sir Alexander Ball. This monument is located in the lower Barakar Gardens of Valletta and was built in 1810 as a memorial to Alexander Ball, a British admiral who was the first civil commissioner of Malta. No alt text provided for this image. Lunch in the city centre After our visit to the monuments, we decided to walk through the city centre back to the main street, where we ate some lunch at one of the many, cosy, terraces. It tasted very well, but I have to say it was also quite crowded. I wouldn't expect anything else though in the main street of Valletta. No alt text provided for this image. The ferry from Valletta to Sliema. Somewhere at the north side of Valletta, you can find the ferry terminal from where you can go to Sliema. The ferry has a great connection between Valletta and Sliema, because in this way you don't have to go by bus all around the outside of Valletta. Going by ferry is way shorter. A boat trip by ferry takes around 15 minutes and the ferry is leaving every half an hour. Depending on the season and day, 
The ferry goes more hours on the day or less hours on the day. A ticket for the ferry costs Euro 1,54 an adult. If you would like to buy a return ticket, this costs Euro 2,80 per person. Children and seniors will get a discount. For all the exact information you can take a look on the official website. A quick look into town and walking along the coastline. Arrived in Sliemer, we bought ourselves an ice cream somewhere at the waterfront and walked through town to explore some more. Unfortunately, Sliemer isn't, in my opinion, a very beautiful town, compared to Valletter. There are many high buildings and there aren't many historical sites. You have some shops, a boulevard and some cafes and restaurants, but much more isn't there. So we walked through town a little and afterwards we decided to walk along the coastline, the boulevard, all the way to St. Julian's. In our opinion, this was the nicest way to explore Sliemer, but of course that's very personal. Spinola Bay in St. Julian's We ended up at Spinola Bay, located in St. Julian's. This was the place where we decided to stop our walk, because it was a really nice bay where the atmosphere was really good. There were many restaurants and cafes where you could sit down and eat or drink something. We decided to take a delicious beer on one of the terraces. Although we didn't like St. Julian's as much as Valletta either, I think this is a better place to visit comparing to Sliema. I really liked Spinola Bay, especially when I wasn't paying attention to the high buildings, har har. No alt text provided for this image. By bus back to Valletta and having dinner. After our drink, we went to the nearest bus station and went by bus back to the city center of Valletta. Somewhere in a little street, we had dinner at an Italian restaurant, which was very nice. We walked a little more around the city and came across a beautiful church in the middle of the center. I definitely loved Valletta and wouldn't mind going back here someday for a city trip. No alt text provided for this image. Day 2, a day trip to Golden Bay. Golden Bay is located next to Gajantuffy on the northwest coast of Malta, nearby the village of Manicator, and known for its red sand and naturally formed dunes on its surrounding slopes. Golden Bay is a popularly visited beach, partly due to the proximity of the five-star Radisson Golden Sands Hotel. Like Gajantuffy, Golden Bay is a sandy beach, but it tends to be more popular because it has a larger stretch of sand, is easier to access and has better facilities, including a few restaurants. It's very easy to reach by public transport and car, although parking can be a challenge on Sundays and public holidays. The beach is a popular location for sunbathing, swimming, water sports, and parties, especially in the evening when sunset admirers fire up their barbecues and enjoy a chilled-out summer night at the beach. During the summer months, a flag system is used to indicate whether the water is safe for swimming and lifeguards are on patrol. Just as is the case at Gajantuffy, Golden Bay is also known for its treacherous undercurrents during the winter months when the weather is less stable. Although few people would consider going for a swim during that time of the year, it's not uncommon for a few adventurous, mostly foreign, people to get into trouble that way. No alt text provided for this image. Day 3, a day trip to Mdener forward slash Rabart. While it can be easy to spend your entire Malta soaking up the Mediterranean sunshine on the coast, the inland towns of Mdener and Rabart are fantastic places to visit as well. Mdener is a popular day trip destination, and it isn't difficult to see why. With a fascinating history as the original capital of Malta and its beautiful walled setting, there are some great things to do in Mdener. Mdena also has a claim to fame as being the filming location for King's Landing in the first season of HBO's Game of Thrones. Luckily, however, it hasn't seemed to have attracted near the number of tourists that Dubrovnik has but it can make you long for the days when Jamie Lannister still had two hands and Ned Stark still had his head. The adjacent town of Rabart, which quite literally translates to suburb, is often overlooked by tourists. However, it is also a wonderful place to visit with some intriguing points of interest. Both towns can also offer a calming refuge from the business of Sliema and the touristy streets of Valletta. In fact, 
Rabat has arguably more places of interest than the far more popular tourist attraction of Mdener, and there are many things to do in Rabat that make it worth visiting. If you're wondering what to do in Mdener and Rabat and plan to visit these cities while on a trip to Malta, then this is the guide for you. Arguably the best way to get around Malta for tourists is by bus. The local bus system is extensive, with multiple reliable connections throughout the island per day. If you are traveling from Valletta, getting to Rabat is incredibly straightforward, as multiple direct buses depart from the main terminal every hour. Depending on the traffic and the time of day you are traveling, the journey should take somewhere from 30 to 40 minutes. Even if you're only intending on visiting Mdena, you still need to take the bus to Rabat. There is no bus station within the walled city of Mdena as they only allow a very limited number of registered cars in. The center of Rabat, however, is only located about a five-minute walk away from the main gates of Mdener so this is not an inconvenience in the slightest. If you are arriving from the north of the island, there are also a number of direct buses that will get you there. As Rabat is a main residential area of Malta, it is well served by public transport so it is, therefore, quite easy to access no matter where you happen to be on the island. If you don't want to rely on the bus, you can opt to drive to Mnena and Rabat, as well. Many people find that renting a car in Malta gives them a bit more flexibility and can be a good option if you're short on time and you don't mind dealing with the crazy Maltese traffic. Mdena and Rabat are located close to the center of the island, so it shouldn't take more than about 30 to 40 minutes to drive to the cities from anywhere on Malta. Things to do in Rabat While the main attraction in this area of Malta is medieval Mdena, the larger town of Rabat is also quite worth exploring in its own right. With a number of interesting attractions, lovely architecture, and a wonderful cafe culture, one can easily spend a leisurely day exploring this wonderful place. St. Paul's Catacombs Nothing provokes the imagination more than a creepy jaunt into the bowels of a church to find out where and how, important, people in ancient Rome were buried, right? While the catacombs of St. Paul are arguably the biggest point of interest for visitors to Rabat, they are still not all that busy, which makes it all the more interesting to enjoy. As the largest underground Roman cemetery in Malta, is it just me, or does that seem like very specific criteria, these catacombs span over 2,000 square meters in area. Believed to be in use up until the 4th century, CE and originally excavated in 1894, they are also the earliest evidence of Christianity in Malta. Admission into the catacombs is 5 euros for adults and 3 euros and 50 cents for concessions, students and seniors, and are well worth exploring if only to get away for some sweet relief from the Maltese sun. St. Paul's Church and Grotto Malta is a very Catholic country and with that means that almost every town has at least one church or cathedral that is a major point of interest. Rabat is not different. St. Paul's Church and Grotto, not to be confused with St. Paul's Catacombs, which are located a little ways down the road and are completely detached from the church, has quite a bit of historical significance when it comes to Catholicism in Malta. It is believed to be the place where St. Paul himself sought refuge after being shipwrecked with his missionary party on the island. It is believed, however, that St. Paul chose to live and pray in the subterranean grotto beneath the church instead of the building itself. St. Paul's Church is a known place of pilgrimage for many practicing Catholics, most notably Pope John Paul II, who visited the premises in 1990. The Roman Villa Located between Rabart and Mner is museum housing the ruins of a traditional Roman villa. While little remains of the villa itself, there is an impressive collection of excellently preserved mosaics and other Roman antiquities that have been found by archaeologists throughout Malta. It also gives an interesting understanding of what life was like in Roman times. Admission into the Villa Museum costs 6 euros for adults and for euros and 50 cents for concessions. Restaurants and cafes in Rabart One of the things that we were incredibly impressed by in Malta was the quality, and value for money, of the food. The local cuisine is delicious and there are myriad fantastic restaurants where you can sample it. There is also a great cafe culture in Rabart that is worth trying out. 
Here are some of our favorite Rabat restaurants and cafes. Crystal Palace. One could easily walk by this local, hole in the wall bakery without a second glance, but that would be a grave mistake. This is because Crystal Palace, located across the street from the Roman villa, makes what numerous sources agree to be the best pastizi in Malta. And this is no joke. Pastizi are small, savory pastries traditionally filled with cheese, meat, or mushy peas, why this is the only culinary takeaway from British colonialism is beyond me, surround by a flaky, phyllo-like dough. Crystal Palace serves fresh from the wood-fired oven pastizi 24 hours per day, all at incredibly low prices. This is an excellent option for an affordable breakfast, lunch, or midnight snack and you should definitely take the time to enjoy these delicious little pies. Ristorante Cosmana Navarra This Italian restaurant located in a traditional home is a fantastic place to eat in Rabart. They have a range of both Italian favorites like pizza and pasta along with traditionally prepared Maltese dishes. The service is quick and prompt and the ambience within the restaurant is great, as well. It is also located very close to St. Paul's Church, making it the perfect place to stop for a break from sightseeing without going too far out of your way. Tar Doni Cafe If you're looking for a good cup of coffee, chilled-out wine bar, or a local craft beer along with good, affordable food and a great atmosphere then look no further than Tar Doni Cafe. Located just a stone's throw down the road from Crystal Palace, this small cafe has an excellent wine list and local craft beer selection along with great sandwiches and fantastic local sharing platters. They also have a lovely outdoor terrace making it a perfect place to sit down, have a cold beverage, and people watch for an hour or two. Things to do in Dina Dina, or the Silent City, is one of the most popular day trip spots in Malta and it's easy to see why. This majestic walled city was the capital of Malta for thousands of years until the Order of the Knights of St. John took up residence and moved it, first to Burgu, one of the three cities, and finally to Valletta. Because of its small size, there aren't a lot of things to do in Dna and it can easily be combined with its neighboring town of Rabart. For visitors that want to learn more about the history of Dna, it's possible to book a walking tour in advance. St. Paul's Cathedral like I've mentioned earlier, no town in Malta is in want of churches, and the same can be said for Mdena. The imposing structure of St. Paul's Cathedral was built in 1693, after a destructive earthquake destroyed the original, believed to have been constructed sometime in the 12th century CE. Inside, there are impressive and intricate artwork and fakids, reminiscent of that from Street John's Co Cathedral in Valletta. There is also a massive mural depicting the shipwreck of St. Paul and his missionary party on the island of Malta, believed to have happened some 1,900 years ago. The Cathedral Museum is also worth visiting, as it houses a number of interesting and intriguing artifacts from Malta through its history. The City Walls Mdena is a completely walled city situated high on a hill, so it is only logical that there would be spectacular vies of the small island nation from the walls. And that is just so. One of the best things to do in Mdena is to watch the sunset over the Mediterranean from the city walls, where you can see the beautiful panorama that is Malta. Mdena by night. While Mdena is a very popular spot to visit in Malta, most tourists only come for a day trip before heading back to their accommodation come nightfall. This leaves the beautiful city almost deserted once the sun sets and makes it one of the best times to wander around. The high marble buildings and low light feel majestic as you can hear your steps echo down the back streets. While walking around Mdenar at night, one can truly understand why this town is referred to as the Silent City. Restaurants and Cafes in Dina. Despite its diminutive size, there are a number of very nice restaurants and cafes in Dina, though some come with very hefty price tags. While some of the best restaurants in Malta are located in Dina, the prices are much higher than similar restaurants elsewhere on Malta and Gozo, so I would recommend eating more at the mid-range restaurants while in Dinner. Fire di Latte There is nothing better than enjoying a lovely scoop of gelato on a hot day, and Fire di Latte has some of the best. 
This little shop located close to the city wall's viewpoint has a large selection of both sweet and fruity flavors and is well worth a stop. Vinum Wine Bar A wonderful wine bar and cafe, this place has a great roof terrace providing spectacular views over Malta and an excellent wine list where most wines are available by the glass. They also serve fantastic traditional sharing platters and also have a full dinner menu. Also, in traditional Maltese fashion, the portion sizes are huge. This place can get popular in the evening, so it is advisable to book in advance. Mdana and Rabart are two of the best places to visit in Malta. Though both quite small, I would recommend taking your time to wander around and explore both towns. There are a number of things to do and interesting sights to see and both are well worth adding to any Malta itinerary. Day 4, Wander the Three Cities On the other side of the Grand Harbour from Valletta, you'll find an area called the Three Cities. Their history goes back to Phoenician times, the area has always been a popular maritime community. But even if you're not a history buff, at least make a quick visit to the three cities in Malta to explore the meticulously kept traditional neighborhoods and to marvel at the Sioux Pirates gracing the marina. A brief history of the three cities in Malta. These so-called three cities are individually called Burgu, Vittoriosa, Isler, Sangli, and Bormler, Kospikwar. The reason for each of those names in parentheses indicates the layers of history here. Burgu, Isla, and Bormler were the original names of the cities before the Order of St. John came to Malta in the 1500s. After successfully surviving the Great Siege of Malta in 1565, the Order of St. John dubbed Burgu Larsiter Vittorioser, the Victoria City. Today, both Burgu and Vittorioser are used for this section of the three cities. On the peninsular called Isla, the city of Sangli was built and Sangli seems to be the more common name used today. Kospikwar, used interchangeably with Bormler, is the inner part of the harbour stretching back up to the old defence walls, known as the Kotnara Lines. Those Kotnara Lines were built in the 1600s to protect the area from land attacks since attacks by sea were already difficult against such a heavily fortified area. The three cities often include a fourth city into their mix. Calcara. Calcara is the peninsula where the Esplorar Interactive Science Center and the Old Royal Naval Hospital are located. That's the peninsula on the left as you're looking across the Grand Harbor from Valletta. Has three cities predate the capital of Valletta, yet they aren't visited nearly as often by tourists. That means that the tourists who do visit are rewarded with an even better glimpse into local life in Malta. Of course, with the depth of history in such a small space, a brief visit to the three cities in Malta merely scratches the surface. But it's a start nonetheless. What to do in the three cities in Malta? In only a few hours, I suggest you simply wander. You could opt to spend your time inside the museums and forts to learn more about the history of the area. But, personally, unless the weather is bad, which is rare in Malta, I would much rather wander a neighborhood and chat with locals to get a feel for the present. You can always research online to learn more in depth at another time. But being there to appreciate the traditional architecture of local homes, the brightly painted shutters and front doors, the hilly streets winding their way around the peninsulars, that's the beauty of travel. Once you disembark from either the ferry or the water taxi from Valletta, head left along the Vittoriosa waterfront. The harbour is filled with some of the most prestigious yachts in the Mediterranean, so a new waterfront area with restaurants and wine bars has grown in recent years. Once you reach Fort St. Angelo, you can walk through the parking lot to find a staircase along the side of the fort. Take that to reach the actual end of the peninsula for lovely views of Valletta across the Grand Harbour. It's also a nice little swimming spot away from the crowds if you want to jump in for a quick dip. Just don't swim out into the middle of the harbour, the boat traffic is constant. The old town of Burgu is fascinating to explore. Wander these narrow streets and enjoy the obvious care residents take to keep their neighbourhood vibrant and beautiful. There are several historic churches in Vittoriosa, see how I keep switching up the names. Now you know how we felt when locals did it to us, if you'd like to explore those, 
and I'm told the festers here are some of the best on the island. I'll have to see for myself. One thing I'd love to check out someday is the Rolling Geeks tour based out of Burgu. We saw their office on the waterfront and then encountered a few carts along our wandering path. These electric, covered golf carts offer a unique way to explore extensive ground in all four areas, Kalkara included. I'll be sure to let you know if I get to do one of their tours. But in the meantime, simply wandering these streets, pausing to pat the local felines and to take in the beautiful views, was a wonderful way to spend an afternoon. The marina is a feast for the eyes and we thoroughly enjoyed scoping out the variety of sailboats and yachts. The white and red ferry you see behind the sailboats runs back and forth to Valletta constantly. Crossing the pedestrian bridge towards Sangli, we opted to just wander up into Kospikwar, rather than heading to the end of the peninsula. That will have to be for another day as I'm told the views are gorgeous from there as well. The hills of Kospikwar were no joke, but I really enjoyed the diversity of topography and seeing how local residents created a community working with the land, rather than trying to mold it to their whims. This zigzag ramp shows the incredible height difference between streets, with buildings constructed despite that gap. Street level on one side of the building is the fifth floor from the other side. After several hours of wandering around, a lovely lunch in Burgu, and taking endless photos of these beautiful three cities, we headed back to Valletta on the ferry to make the journey home. Until next time, three cities. I'm sure you'll see me again several times. How to get to the three cities in Malta? Buses from Valletta are an option to reach the three cities, but there's no better way than to take a water taxi across the Grand Harbour. The water taxis are traditional Maltese boats, seen here in comparison to a cruise ship docked at Valletta. To find the ferry dock and water taxi departure point, you can take the elevator from the upper Barakar Gardens in Valletta. It will bring you down to street level below, take a left and you'll see an entrance on your right to reach the water. The water taxis leave from right there, while the ferry departure is just around that building. You'll see a few benches under a canopy for shade at the ferry departure point. If you take a bus to Valletta and want to head directly over to the three cities, get off at the bus terminus and walk across the street toward the water. Take a right along that wall with the garden areas and you'll come upon a long staircase on your left. That brings you down to street level, just go left at the bottom of the stairs past the cruise ship area and you'll come upon the departure points eventually on your right. The ferry costs 1 euro and 50 cents each way while the water taxi is 2 euros. Go for the water taxi at least one way for a beautiful ride across the harbour. Day 5, a day in Gozo and forward slash or Kumano. Some beautiful treasures are waiting to be discovered. Find out about the sister islands of Gozo and Kumano, about how easy it is getting there and getting around, about the choice of accommodation available, from top-range hotels to idyllic farmhouses. Read about what to see and do, check out useful information about services and contacts to help you plan your trip. Whether you decide to spend your entire stay on Gozo or Kumano, or if you want to make it a side trip during your holiday in Malta, you will find that these are truly special places. Steeped in myth, Gozo is thought to be the legendary Calypso's Isle of Homer's Odyssey, a peaceful, mystical backwater. Baroque churches and old stone farmhouses dot the countryside. Gozo's rugged landscape and spectacular coastline await exploration with some of the Mediterranean's best dive sites. The island also comes complete with historical sites, forts and amazing panoramas, as well as one of the archipelago's best-preserved prehistoric temples, Gantager. To discover the true magic of swimming, diving and enjoying all the activities the sea has to offer, Kumano is the island that must be explored. The island's blue lagoon, with its safe bathing in bright turquoise waters, makes a memorable day out by boat. The island is tiny in size, with just one hotel, but it is otherwise uninhabited and is surrounded by the most scintillating and transparent waters in the Mediterranean. A natural swimming pool, many snorkel, scuba dive and anchor their yachts for a day of swimming and relaxing. In winter, Kumano is great for walkers and photographers. Without urban areas or cars, there is no pollution or noise, 
just quiet and serenity. Day 6, a day in the Melia area. No alt text provided for this image. Melia is the northernmost town in Malta. Unless you are specifically visiting the island's largest sandy beach or actually staying in Melia itself, it is often dismissed as a place to visit. If traveling to Gozo you'll pass through Melia to get to and from the ferry terminal. Like other Maltese villages, Melia is well worth visiting and at least worth a day of your time. Here's just 10 reasons to pop by. By a palace at Selmun. A small district of Melia, Selmun is often dismissed by visitors and often not known about at all. Overlooking the area is Selmun Palace, built by the Knights of Malta during the reign of Grand Master Manuel de Rohan. Used as both a hunting lodge and noble residence, it not only had acres of grounds attached to it, but also boasted views across Melia and beyond. Later used by the British as a naval hospital during the Maltese rebellion against the French. In more recent years, the Selmun Palace Hotel was built adjacent to the palace, but running at a loss it eventually closed in 2011. Now left uninhabited and unattended, the building is beginning to see the ravages of time and is presently for sale, if you a spare few million euros. Relax on the largest sandy beach. Gadira Bay, or Melia Bay, not only has the largest sandy beach on the island, but is also one of Malta's 12 beaches that have been awarded with blue flag status. This popular tourist spot with shallow, clear waters that stretch out for almost a mile has plenty of facilities on hand. Sun loungers and umbrellas can be hired, refreshment kiosks are open all day, wheelchair accessibility has been installed and numerous water sports take place. Stroll a little farther along the beach to catch boat trips to Kumano and the Blue Lagoon. Enjoy home-cooked food at Zoza's restaurant. Family-owned and run Zoza's bar and restaurant is set away from the main village of Melier in Gaidera Bay. Specializing in Maltese food with a Mediterranean twist, everything is cooked by Marmar. As well as a fixed menu, the restaurant also offers daily specials based on what is in season. Using recipes handed down from generation to generation and vegetables cultivated in the family's field, you won't taste fresher. Experience a friendly and welcoming family atmosphere accompanied by scenic views along with probably the best food in Melia. Enjoy the sun with the locals. Comprising two beaches, Armia Bay and Little Armia Bay, this place is much quieter and set in a rural area of Melia. Frequented predominantly by locals, there's the opportunity to hire a sunbed and umbrella or enjoy an equal amount of space dedicated to people who bring their own towels to relax on. With a refreshment kiosk on hand serving drinks, ice creams and hot and cold food, there's no need to worry about taking your own. As with other Maltese beaches, the waters are clear and remain shallow for quite some distance. The bay's locations can mean they are quite a walk from the nearest bus stop, so it's best to visit by car. Visit the film set of Pope. No alt text provided for this image. 1980 saw the release of Pope the film starring Robin Williams and filmed in Malta. Nearly 40 years on, the set still stands as a major tourist attraction. Wander round Sweetharven and experience firsthand the village of crooked buildings looking out over the Mediterranean. Now with swimming pools, sunbathing areas, boat trips, dining areas, a couple of gift shops and plenty of entertainment from the animators included, Pope Village is a perfect place for all the family to spend the best part of a day. Visit the church in the square. Located in Melia's main square is the parish church, built between 1883 and 1898. Using Maltese stone from a nearby quarry, each piece was carried to the site by people classed as peasants at the time. The church is dedicated to the birth of Our Lady. When the first stone of the church was laid it was blessed by the parish priest, Rev. Francis Maria Magri, and again blessed by Bishop Pietro Pace on completion. The neighboring sanctuary of Our Lady was constructed in the late 16th century, and extended in following years as the population of Melia grew. 1990 saw Pope John Paul II blessing the sanctuary while visiting Malta, photographs of which remain on display inside. Experience World War II at the air raid shelters. No alt text provided for this image. 
A few steps away from Melia's parish square, you'll find one of the largest World War II underground air raid shelters on the island. Open to the public daily, the small doorway leading in is quite misleading to what actually lies behind. The tunnels, which have a depth of 12 meters and stretch for over 500 meters, were completely hand dug. A main corridor leads to separate rooms that had many uses, such as a maternity room and a room for valuables which remained guarded during the war. Protecting the Melia community and refugees, more well-off families were able to apply for a license to dig their own separate room. With sound effects and mannequins, the shelters today make a wonderful visitor attraction and at the same time provide a cool break from the sunshine outside. Be at one with nature. Gadira Nature Reserve sits opposite the beach, a seven-acre land of salt marshes and a large lake. Open every weekend between November and May, it provides visitors with the best times of year to see Malta's wildlife at its best. The reserve is part of Malta's BirdLife project and as well as providing the public with locations to see the wildlife they provide rehabilitation for injured birds. With hides open for birdwatchers and photographers and wild flowers popping up as early as February, this is also an ideal location to spot some lizards scurrying through the undergrowth. Run by knowledgeable volunteers who are only too happy to answer your questions. Visit a hidden shrine. No alt text provided for this image. Across the main road from many a shelters is this tranquil and captivating grotto. Accessed through a small gateway and down a flight of steps, this place often gets walked straight past by visitors unaware of what sits beneath their feet. A place of pilgrimage, the rear walls are lined with handwritten letters of gratitude and prayers. A perfect place to sit in silence, light a candle and collect your thoughts. The Red Tower No alt text provided for this image. Standing tall on St. Maffer's Ridge, Melia, is St. Agatha's Tower, more commonly known as the Red Tower due to its painted color, which remained during its restoration process. This watchtower, protecting the straits between Malta and Gozo, was built in 1649 when the island was under the rule of Grand Master Jean Paul Lascaris Castilla. Dedicated to St. Agatha, the tower houses a small chapel and originally had two extra rooms used as the sleeping areas for its 49 man garrison. The tower's distinct color, location, and for turrets make it visible across Melia. Day 7 A Day in Bujibar. No alt text provided for this image. Bujibar is a peaceful, Maltese holiday resort where you can get away from the frenzied life of bigger cities. You can visit this tiny vacation hub and book a room overlooking the sea as your headquarters for an energizing and mood-boosting sabbatical in Malta. Here is why you should pick Bujibar as your next travel destination. What and where is Bujibar? Few people know about Bujibar before traveling to Malta. This small resort is part of the St. Paul's Bay region on the northern coast of the island. Many tourists rent a room at one of the many hotels in the area all year round, but not many of them are aware of the actual name of where they are staying. Even tourist guides refer to Bujibar differently. Some name it a village, others a zone, and some call it the northern district of St. Paul's Bay. Whichever that may be, if you are anywhere between the salt pans of Cora and the Guinea you harbor, there is a good chance that you are in Bujibar. Why visit Bujibar? No alt text provided for this image. Malta is a spectacular tourist destination that abounds in sightseeing attractions. Between historical landmarks and entertainment options, there is very little time or room to get bored on the island. However, most of these places tend to be overcrowded with visitors, and if you are struggling with anxiety and agoraphobia, you might want to avoid them. Bujibar is a much better and safer choice for spending a relaxing holiday in Malta. This peaceful resort offers all the amenities of larger vacation spots, but with less agitation and fewer visitors. Most of the tourists that decide to set up camp here are the opposite of heavy partygoers. If you want to keep your leisure time at a slow pace and rhythm, you will find like-minded people in this area. A Brief History of Bujibar no alt text provided for this image. Bujibar has served as a human settlement ever since the 4th millennia BC, 
and a small stone temple from that era still survives to this day. You can visit the archaic relic that is now on the premises of a hotel, as well as the remains of a military battery that the Order of St. John built here in 1715. The present-day resort of Bujibar and the surrounding region served small communities of fishermen and farmers for centuries until the middle of the 20th century when it gradually developed into a touristic zone. Why is Bujibar so popular? Bujibar offers great accommodation options at one of the many prestigious hotels in the area. The region also abounds in restaurants that serve anything from local cuisine to fine dining and bars where you can taste some of the local beer and the renowned Maltese wines. Bujibar is one of the best locations on the island from where you can go on daily trips around Malta. This resort is well connected with important tourist attractions in the surrounding area. From here, you can easily get to the present-day capital city of Valletta, the ancient capital of Ndana, the Melia beaches, the nightlife scene of Paceville, the shopping centers in Sliema and St. Julian's, there are several bus routes that you can use to get to almost any place on the island. It takes little over an hour to reach the airport and just 45 minutes to arrive in Valletta. The sandy beaches of Golden Bay and Gajantufihar are also close by, and it would take you less than 15 minutes by car from your hotel in Bujibar. What to do in Bujibar? Bujibar is ideal for a relaxing vacation, but just like almost every location in Malta, there are several tourist attractions you can try during your stay. Here are some of the best things to do in Bujibar to spice up your vacation. Go for a stroll on the promenade. Probably the biggest attraction in Bugibar is the seaside promenade that stretches for 3.5 kilometers between Cora and St. Paul's Bay. This gorgeous waterfront is ideal for evening walks or morning jogging. If you are traveling with your dog, then this waterfront should provide both of you with the necessary dose of roaming and exercise. Take a boat to St. Paul's Island. Just off the shore of Bujibar, you can see a small patch of land called St. Paul's Island. According to the local legends and Christian folklore, this is the place where St. Paul shipwrecked in the middle of the 1st century AD before beginning to preach Christianity to the locals. You can book a boat tour from the nearby harbor and visit the tiny island on a trip that should not last more than a couple of hours. Hang out in the Bugibber Harbor. No old text provided for this image. Even if you don't want to sail to St. Paul's Island, the Bugibber Harbor is still worth a visit. The small marina shelters numerous fishing boats that bear colorfully painted Maltese symbols and patterns. They give a nice touch of authenticity to an otherwise international touristic resort. Relax on the rocky beach. If you don't want to go to the nearby sandy beaches of Golden Bay and Melia, you can still get a nice tan on the rocky beaches of Bujibar. The sunbathing area is small, but it has several inlets that offer easy access to crystal clear water. Dive from the stony shores. No old text provided for this image. The rocky coastline of Bujibar offers several rock diving places where you can take a safe plunge into the neon blue waters of the Mediterranean Sea. Look for popular diving spots or ask the locals which ones are the best in the area. Go shopping in the Bugibar Square. Bugibar Square is packed with local shops and retail stores from famous brands. If you want to pick up a souvenir to take back home or just to upgrade your wardrobe this is the place to be. Watch a football game in a sports pub. Bujibar is a popular holiday spot for British tourists who unsurprisingly have a burning passion for football. If you share their infatuation with the most popular sport in the world, you can watch your favorite team play in one of the many sports pubs in Bugibar. Day 8, A Day at the Beaches Eight of the best beaches in Malta Malta has beaches for everyone whether you're looking for somewhere fun for the whole family or a quieter beach off the beaten path. What do you do on Mediterranean islands that bask in sunshine more than 300 days a year? Hit the beach, of course. But there's much more to do on Malta's strands than snooze under an umbrella. Whether you're a snorkeler or a kite surfer, looking for peace or a party, Malta has the perfect beach for you. Rocky plunge pools towering cliffs and turquoise lagoons, you'll find them all on Malta and its little sisters of Gozo and Komono. 
The most popular beaches come fully equipped with cafes, sunshades and firms offering windsurfing, water skiing and jet ski hire, while the quietest are so remote you may share them only with seabirds. And thanks to Malta's benign climate the prime beach season lasts from May until late in October. Malta and Gozo travel specialist Choice Holidays offers brilliant value beach breaks all over the islands, including beautiful Melia Bay, and is a great online resource for insider tips about where to find the best beaches in Malta and Gozo. Melia Bay, also called Gaydera Bay. Water sports on Malta's longest sandy beach. No alt text provided for this image. Blue flagged Melia Bay is the perfect family beach. Gently sloping golden sands make for safe, warm bathing, even in autumn, and there's a fantastic range of water sports including windsurfing, kite surfing, water skiing, canoeing, sea kayaking, parasailing and banana boating. Gurjan Tuffihar A secret cove for sunset. No alt text provided for this image. Down a flight of 100 steps, amid tamarisk and samphire, the delicious cove of Gujantufihar is many locals' favorite Maltese beach. Its blue-flagged, silk-soft, archicolored sands are perfect for chillaxing, and the views are fantastic, crescendoing at dusk into one of Malta's most beautiful and romantic sunsets. Fomayari Wild and isolated Brave the steep path down to Fom Iri and you'll be rewarded with one of Malta's wildest and most isolated beaches, garnished with superb coastal views. The clear water is a magnet for divers and snorkelers, and the hinterland cries out to be explored on foot. St. George's Beach Handy for party people No alt text provided for this image. The popular resort of St. Julian's lacked a sandy beach, so they made one, just a short stroll from the bars, restaurants and nightclubs of Paceville, Malta's party capital. St. George's was the island's first blue flag beach, with Paranger Beach Club at one end and a bunch of bars and restaurants behind it, and there's always something going on, from life-saving demonstrations to eco events. Street Peter's Pool Test your nerve on nature's diving board. No alt text provided for this image. Despite its idyllic beauty Street Peter's Pool is seldom crowded and deliciously undeveloped. A natural, rocky swimming pool, tucked away on Malta's Delamere Peninsula, it has pale green waters that will make you reach for your snorkel and mask or dare you to leap in from the encircling rocks. Ramla Bay Spoil the kids on Gozo's most perfect beach. No alt text provided for this image. The soft, red sands of Ramla Bay, nestling at the foot of a fertile valley, form Gozo's prettiest beach. Clean shallow water makes it great for families, and you can seek out Roman remains or drink in the views near Calypso's cave, legendary home of the nymph with whom Odysseus tarried for seven years. Dwerger Bay and the Inland Sea Dive Gozo's geological masterpiece Dwerger on Gozo is one of Malta's most spectacular natural wonders. Its pools and submerged caves are some of the archipelago's best diving spots, and a natural sea tunnel 250 feet long and up to 80 feet deep connects it to the inland sea, a serene lagoon completely encircled by cliffs and ideal for swimming and snorkeling. Blue Lagoon Swim and snorkel amid breathtaking beauty. With its bright, white sands and shallow, turquoise water, the Blue Lagoon on Little Comino Island could have been plucked straight from the Caribbean. The lagoon, only accessible by boat, is rated Malta's top spot for swimming, and is ringed by sun-warmed rocks where you can bask before your next delicious dip. Day 9, a day forward slash half day in Masak's Lock. No alt text provided for this image. There's much to discover in the colorful village of Masak's Lock. After visiting the famous sites of Valletta and Mner, dive into the depths of Maltese culture at Masak's Lock, a beautiful fishing town in southern Malta that's famous for its colorful Luzu boats. From swimming in Street Peter's Pool and discovering historic forts, to browsing the Masakslok fish market and dining alongside the island's largest and most picturesque harbour, there's plenty to see and do. Located just a 30-minute drive from the hotel, this is the perfect destination for a day trip to the southern shores of Malta. Gaze at colorful Luzu boats. 
The vessels that bob in the harbor of Masaxlok are more than your average fishing boats. Known as luzes, these traditional and distinctive Maltese boats are brightly painted in primary colors. In keeping with traditions dating back to Phoenician times, the Eye of Horus, an ancient Egyptian symbol of protection, is painted on the front bow to protect fishermen out at sea. The boats are attractions in themselves and a colorful symbol of the Maltese islands. Browse Masaxlok Fish Market Seek out fresh off-the-boat fish and seafood at the Masaxlok Fish Market. Taking place every Sunday, the popular market has expanded in recent years to include stalls offering souvenirs and local produce such as jam, honey, vegetables and wine. It's a fascinating opportunity to mix with the locals and experience everyday Maltese life. Feast on fresh seafood. When in Masaxlok, dining at one of the many seafood restaurants that line the harbor is a must. Pick a table on the terrace overlooking the harbor at Principino Restaurant or La Nostra Padrona and dine on fresh seafood as you watch the boats come and go. There are also several bars overlooking the harbor, such as Southport Villa, that offer fantastic views and drinks at sunset. Swim in Street Peter's Pool A beautiful natural pool carved into the Maltese coast, Street Peter's Pool is an excellent spot for swimming and sunbathing. Flat rocks surrounding the enclave provide a comfortable resting place, while the calm azure waters are inviting to swimmers of all ages. If you're feeling adventurous, jump right into the blue, or climb one of the ladders provided. Visit Masaxlok Parish Church Dominating the village skyline is the Masaxlok Parish Church. Dedicated to Our Lady of Pompeii, the 19th-century Roman Catholic Church is typically Maltese and is worth visiting for its beautiful gold, white and red interiors. Take special note of the historical statues that decorate the building and the paintings by Maltese artist Giuseppe Cali. See Fort Delamra. Fort Delamra, which film buffs may recognize from 2016 movie Assassin's Creed, is one of the island's many coastal defenses built by the Knights of Malta. It may not be as grand as the fortifications of Valletta, but its unique location, built into the cliff face, is a sight to behold. The fort is in danger due to coastal erosion so it isn't open to the public, but you can see it from the outside with a walking tour or boat ride around Delamere Point. Seek out St. Lucian Tower Adventurers with a passion for history can visit St. Lucian Tower, an ancient polygonal fort that's now home to the Malta Aquaculture Research Centre. The impressive structure, built by the Order of St. John in the 17th century is one of the largest watchtowers on the island. The idea for the building allegedly came about in a dream when a woman claimed that, during her sleep, St. John told her the area around Masaxlok needed to be fortified. While her dream was ignored, soon thereafter there was an attack, so the fort was built. Tours inside the tower are offered on Saturdays at 10 a.m. for small groups and 11 a.m. for larger bookings. Day 10, Ngur Ngur is the main farming village in Malta. It offers a traditional village center with genuine local eateries, vast countryside with some spectacular views and also some of the best coastline on the island. Take a day tour on your way to Nejner Bay for amazing coastline views of Fom Iri. Ngur is famous with the Maltese for being one of the best places to enjoy typical Maltese specialties such as stewed rabbit and snails in garlic in a more rural environment. If you are feeling adventurous enough to try these typical delicacies, dine at one of the small bars around the parish church of St. Mary which serve typical Maltese food with no frills. For contrast, take a brief walk to Castello Zimitello on the road towards the picturesque Nejner Bay, to admire one of the favorite venues for chic wedding parties on the island. If you can deal with the steep hill leading from the square down to the beach, visit the picturesque Bay of Nejna, with its colorful boat houses which serve as shelters from the summer heat for families on their beach excursions. While the village itself is tiny, the coastline pertaining to Mgur extends from Farm Iri, a particularly beautiful, desolate spot to enjoy a swim in azure waters beneath steep cliffs further south, to the more accessible Bijantufihar Bay with its golden sands further north. These pretty inlets were favorite sheltering places for pirates of old, and Lipiger Tower was built in 1657 by Grand Master Lascaris to protect Nejna and the few families living at Ngur.
While the parish church of Mver is famous for its unusual egg-shaped dome, Mver also has some of the oldest places of worship known to man. Visit the Skabur temples, which have been entered in the Guinness Book of Records as one of the two oldest freestanding structures in the world. Another important set of megalithic structures is at Tar Hagrat. Keep your eyes open for the ancient cart ruts which can be found all over the village. Not nearly as old are the thermal Roman baths near Gajantuffy Harbay. You are certain to feel welcome in the village of Mgur, where the residents are keen to live up to the village motto, small, with a big heart. Day 11, see towns like Msider, Zura, and Manuel Island and then fly home.